you're good. Um, and if you're not muted, I'll probably mute you. So no offense to that one. Uh, tonight, I do wanna mention, we're gonna be talking about iNaturalist and, you, and community science, community monitoring, um, volunteer science, and some of these ways that we've used that around um, both the Monterey Bay area locally, and hopefully um, Rebecca will touch on other ways they're being used in the more state, national, maybe international context as well. Um, but on that note, we have a couple of in-person opportunities to be a community scientist that we want to give you a heads up about. This weekend, the Elkhorn Slough Reserve is hosting a BioBlitz for Earth Day on Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon, and it's on our website at elkhornslough.org. Um, we do ask you to RSVP, but there's lots of space since we're outdoors and have plenty of distance. So you're welcome to join in there. The California Academy of Science also has some upcoming opportunities. They're doing the City Nature Challenge, which is a annual springtime uh, challenge to get outside and document as much nature in our cities and in our urban spaces, because there's a whole lot of animals that live with us um, and around us in a part of our communities. And then in June, there's gonna be another big statewide challenge um, or collaboration, people working together to collect data. And that will be Snapshot Cow Coast, which is a personal favorite. We're gonna be doing a bio blitz at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve, um, but there will be tons of different opportunities to get out to the coast and take photos and observations of the wildlife there that um, goes towards supporting monitoring efforts around our marine protected areas. So lots of opportunities to get engaged. I will throughout the night in the chat be dropping any helpful links that come up, links to the California Academy of Sciences page, links to our page, all the helpful links, you'll get all of them, I promise. Um, and again, for those who joined late, we will be recording this and streaming it. So lots of ways to engage and to watch. And with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our speaker. Rebecca Johnson is the co-director um, at the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, I've worked with her off and on for a couple of years now, and I have to admit, she's one of my like personal heroes. She's this yeah. amazing scientist who goes out and takes the realm of science that has long been felt as kind of separate from all the other things in our society and really gets people engaged in science um, and doesn't just communicate science, she shows people how to do it and incorporates them into what's going on and into the data um, and builds those connections in really great ways and really meaningful ways around our Northern California area and beyond. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Rebecca, and I turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Ariel. So nice to hear that um, after a long day at work and you know, sometimes when you do a lot of work like this, so you don't, you know, it's good to hear that it's meaningful from people and um, I really appreciate hearing from you about it. And I'm really, really happy to have this opportunity to be here with all of you tonight. Um, I love the Elkhorn Slough. I live in San Francisco, but my husband's parents grew up in Watsonville. And um, so we spend a lot of time in Watsonville and near the slough. So it's a place that's um, near and dear to our family's heart. So um, I'm happy to have gotten to think about it a little bit today in preparation for this talk. and. Um, I hope that I'll um, maybe run into some of you down there sometime soon. Um, so tonight, um, I am going to talk to you about the work that we do um, in my center, which is called the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science here at the Cal Academy. And what I'm really gonna talk to you about is how you in your everyday lives or in special places like Elkhorn Slough, which may or may not be in your everyday life, at life, um, how you can take pictures of nature and share those um, photos and how through just that act of observing nature and sharing what you find, you can contribute to science and conservation. So I'm gonna go through a few different things. Hopefully I'll leave some time for questions, um, but please write some questions in the, the chat and I think Ariel will be monitoring it and um, hopefully we'll have a time, a little bit of time for discussion. All right. So here at the Academy, um, the work that we do together with communities, we call it community science. Um, it's really working with people everywhere to do science together. And the kind of science we do is around understanding biodiversity, around understanding nature. And these are some of the goals of our department. 
um, our goals are to engage people in and have them learn more about natural history science. That's the kind of science we do at the California Academy of Sciences. We're a natural history museum where we have natural history museum collections that help us understand where plants and animals have been found through time, the diversity of those plants and animals um, and how plants and animals are related to each other. And we can all do the basics of natural history, right? Which is observing plants and animals and how they live, um, what they eat, what eat, eats them, what um, environments they are found in. And so one of our goals is to just engage people in that type of science. Um, we work to connect people to their local nature and help them realize that biodiversity is everywhere. You don't have to just go places like Yosemite or far away um, to be around and observe nature. Um, to connect people to each other and build community around nature and nature exploration. And to collect biodiversity data for science management and conservation. Now, to do all this, we use a tool called iNaturalist. Um, and so hopefully many of you have already used iNaturalist or maybe have heard about it, but I'm gonna go over a little bit about what it is and how it works. Um, it's an app and a website for you to share photos um, of plants, animals, life, anything that you see, evidence of life, um, and share it with a community. And so how, iNaturalist lets you do a few different things. So these are just some screenshots of what that app looks like. Um, the first step in making an iNaturalist observation is taking a photo. Um, and so the first thing that iNaturalist is, is a way for you to shit, like to save the observe nature observations that you've made. And you can see here on this screen, um, you know, this is an observation of a poppy that my co-director Allison made. And these are just some shots for what the app can do, I'll tell you a little bit about, more about how it works, but you can see it has a list of like all the observations that she's ever made. So it's kind of like a little nature notebook where you can keep track of what you saw, where and when. It's also a, a way that you can see what other people have seen around you. So anywhere you are with the app, if you open it, there's a tab called Explore and you can see other observations that others have made where around where you're standing. So this is really great when you're traveling somewhere new, you might wanna see like, oh, I'm in a new city. Um, where do people see birds around here? So you can open the app and you can see where people have, have seen birds. And the way iNaturalist works is to use it, you need to take a clear photo of what you wanna upload. And so for example, if I saw this flower, if I was walking along, I would wanna take a photo that really centers the flower so you can see all the parts pretty close up and take a picture and then upload it. And you can see here on this next screen, because I'm using my phone, it automatically marked it with the date and time and the place because it, the phone is tagging the photo with my location. And then where this button, right, and you can see the photo I took right here. Um, if you wanted to add more photos, you can push plus and you can add more photos, which is really great to take pictures of different parts of this flower. So if you wanted to take a close-up picture of a leaf or if it was a little bigger, right? You wanted to really get in on the flower or if it was a bush and you wanted to get a picture of the whole thing, the more photos you add, the better. It helps people um, see, really see and the parts, um, the diagnostic characters of the thing that you're trying to take a picture of. And then you can see this button here that says, what did you see? So if you know what this is, you can push that button and you can type in the name of the thing that you took a picture of. But if you don't, or even if you do, and you don't remember how to spell it, or you don't want to write, type it all the way out, you push, what did I see? And there's machine learning built into the app and the app will make suggestions about what you saw. So you can see here that if you push, what did you see? It makes a suggestion. It says, we're pretty sure this is in the genus Originon and this is a flea bane. So we're pretty sure that's what it is. But here are our top 10 suggestions. And the first one here is Seaside Daisy. Um, and I know that's what that is. So you can push that and it will tag that photo with that name and then you can hit share or a check mark depending on if you're using an iPhone or an Android and it will upload it to iNaturalist. And so in that way, by using iNaturalist, like I can learn what that plant is. If I didn't know what it was, like it's a good picture, it makes a suggestion to me. I can either learn or I can be reminded of what it is. I and mean, that's really just the, the first step of iNaturalist. The next step is that that photo, once you click share, is shared with a community of naturalists online. 
And this is over a million people online who have made and shared observations and also who work together as a community to identify those observations. So I just, let's say I just uploaded that picture of the seaside daisy. So I'm like, okay, upload it. And the machine learning suggested it. So you could just be done there. But the community works to curate those observations and to agree or disagree with the identification that either you made or the machine learning made. Um, and so how this works is this is the same observation, right? I uploaded this picture of the seaside daisy and you can see that two people here came in and said, oh yeah, that is a, a seaside daisy. Now, if I had taken a picture of a sunflower and called it a seaside daisy, they could come in and say, no, that's a sunflower. And um, it would change the ID that I, that I made. But once a, a two people have agreed to your identification, this becomes what's called research grade. So research grade observations are observations with a date, a location that has some evidence like a photo or a sound for things that make sound, especially birds, and has an ID supported by two or more people. And um, once it has all of these things, that information is shared with external databases. So not just on iNaturalist, but with other databases. So when you're sharing your observations, like it's first shared with INAD and the community vets it. And you can learn from the community. You know, people will say, hey, Rebecca, like if you took another picture, it would help me identify that plant or that butterfly. Um, and will help you learn and be a better natural historian, to be a better naturalist. So once you take that picture and it's shared, it's shared on, iNat on iNaturalist. And this, these data on iNaturalist are open for anyone to use. And there have been almost 95 million observations made on iNaturalist from all over the world. Um, and that's incredible, right? This is, iNaturalist is now the largest single source of biodiversity data in the world. But those research grade observations are shared with another database that's called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And this is an online also open database, but this is the same database where species occurrence data from museum specimens are shared. So as biodiversity researchers, GBIF or the Global Biodiversity Information Facility is really the first place you go to understand where plants or animals, if you're interested in a particular group, where they've been found through museum collections, so in the past, um, and then on iNaturalist, now as um, like current observations. So this is really like the gold standard of biodiversity data. And when you think about those iNat data, like here's an iNaturalist observation of a poppy. Remember it has who collected it, who took that picture, me or Allison in this case, um, the date and time and location and some evidence. And those are the same bits of information that you find on museum specimens. And so each of these data points, whether it's for a, a museum specimen or for an INAP observation, makes a species occurrence record. And these species occurrence records are what help us understand where species are found now and how that's changing. If you think about any field guide you've ever used that has a range map, those range maps are usually made from museum specimens um, or other naturalist observations. And now we can use iNaturalist observations to help complement that our understanding of species ranges. Obviously with iNaturalist observations, we don't have a specimen. So we can't do all of the things that we can do with specimens. Like we can't do molecular analysis. We can't do deep dives into the shape or the anatomy, but it does give us a record of where a plant or animal is found at a certain time. So in these data, iNaturalist data from GBIF, so access through GBIF, are used in scientific publications. So just last year, there were over 900 papers published using iNaturalist data. And since iNaturalist has existed, there have been 2,317 um, publications from these iNaturalist data. And these are scientific publications. And iNaturalist is all parts of the tree of life. So this this um, graph here just shows you all of the different groups um, of animals or plants or life that um, have been all the data that's been used from all of these different parts of the tree of life um, to under the INAT data has helped fuel research into these, um, the diversity of life. So these data are really, really important for, for science. All right, so INAT data is also used for management. And so this is a map of the Elkhorn Slough. Um, that tells you, this is an amazing map, 
that I found online that tells you all about the different habitat types of the Elkhorn Slough. And so when managers make these kind of maps, they use all kinds of different data. They use LIDAR data, they use satellite data, they use vegetation survey data, but often they don't have point count data, like point data to know what, which species are found where. Um, so you can take a map like this that's made with all kinds of big, big data and you can look at INAT data from the same place and you kind of can ground truth some of those other data to see like, hey, the LIDAR or the satellite image is telling me that this is an oak woodland, but like, is there an oak tree found in this at the edge of these two places? And it can really help you kind of um, just ground truth or learn more about those, those big data. Um, and so if you're looking at this, this is a, the Elkhorn Slough. These are all of the INAT observations that have been made just in this little orange boundary of the Elkhorn Slough. And if you look closely at them, there have been about almost 17,000 observations made in that place. This is a lot of observations by um, about 1,300 people. And if you look on INAT, not only can you use those data to answer management questions, like you can see what are the most observed species in that area. And so this is a list of the species from most observed to least observed. This is only, you know, the the first 15. So this is not all of the species. There have been over 1,200 species observed um, in the Elkhorn Slough, but the first most observed species is a harbor seal. And then you can see a lot of um, shorebirds and then um, another marine mammal, sea lion. But as all of you know, a lot of people come to the Elkhorn Slough to see birds. And so those are some of the most observed things. And all of these screenshots, these pictures that I'm showing you, you can look at all of these data. So anyone can go to iNaturalist online and search any place that they love or that they know well or wanna learn more about and see what other people have seen there in addition to contributing your own observations. So when people are out and making observations using iNaturalist, you know, you might take pictures of things in, like harbor seals at the Elkhorn Slough, which might not be particularly surprising, but you also can upload and find and have a community to learn about your amazing finds. So I wanna tell you a couple of stories. So the first story is about this huge fish that was found by Tom Turner and his son on the beach of Santa Barbara. This is an amazing huge fish. Many of you maybe have seen this fish. And if you saw it on the beach, you would say, oh, this looks a lot like a mola mola, like an ocean sunfish, this is a huge fish. So he took this picture and uploaded it. And he, it started a conversation on iNaturalist. You know how I said a lot of times people just uh, like agree with your observation. And you can see here, a couple of people agreed with him. And then people said, but wait, like it actually looks a little different. Can you take some more pictures? Can you go back? Like, this is a dead fish, right? So he could go back. So he took a lot of, a lot of um, more pictures and people started commenting and tagging other people because iNaturalist is a social media site. And one of the people they tagged was a woman um, who had actually recently described a new species of mola. So not mola mola, but another species of mola called mola tecta. And she said, this is mola tecta. This isn't mola mola, this is mola tecta. This is a different species. This is amazing, right? And people said, holy mola. Like they made all these jokes because like, this is not the fish we expected. And, and you know, sometimes it's like you name something the wrong thing and then you learn what it is. It's exciting. But the reason, one of the reasons, so they said, okay, this is mola tecta. And that sounds like, okay, it's a different species. But the reason this was so amazing that until then, this species, mola tecta, was only known from the Southern Hemisphere. So it was only known from New Zealand and Australia. So this was the first record ever of this fish in the Northern Hemisphere, made just because someone took a picture and uploaded it to iNaturalist and the community was there to help interpret and understand, like, and help him understand the importance of what he found. And it turns out actually that looking back at a lot of photos of mola mola is taken off the coast of California, that maybe that mola tecta has been here for longer than this observation, but it was overlooked because people weren't looking um, closely enough at photos or specimens. They just said, oh, it's mola mola because they didn't know about this, this specimen. So this kind of interaction, you know, happens a lot for scientists, like people send them pictures, maybe they email them and they send them back, but this is a way that it can be done in public and it's really democratized this process. So not only can anyone do it, anyone can be a part of this conversation. 
So I wanted to tell you about a couple other finds. So this is an amazing little sea slug or nudibranch that was found by a volunteer of ours, someone I work closely with. Um, it's really beautiful. It's probably a couple inches big. It was found in the San Francisco Bay and um, it was posted on iNaturalist. Nobody knew what it was at first. And with a team of um, nudibranch or sea slug experts weighing in, it turns out that this was the first record of this species from the San Francisco Bay. So Japanese species that had never been seen here. The woman that wrote this paper that published the new record was in high school when she wrote this. So she found this species with her mom and um, she wrote this paper up when she was in high school talking about this, this new record. Um, there's another amazing story. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a blue isopod. So this is a roly poly or a pill bug. You know, if you turn over rocks, you can see them, you know, all over. They're either usually like a introduced European roly poly or a really rare native one. But it turns out there are some that are infected with a virus that makes them turn bright blue. And so people wrote a paper about the distribution of this virus based on community collected data. And so they had a distribution, like the distribution that they had was so much greater than they ever could have had without people sharing photos of roly polies. Um, and then this is a land slug, it might not look very exciting. I love land slugs, so I think this is amazing. Um, this is an amazing little land slug that was found in the hills kind of east of San Diego by a group of intrepid amateur slug lovers. And they were actually on the hunt for this slug because it hadn't been seen in almost 70 years. And so they went looking for it. These are, these are like volunteer naturalists and they documented this species um, by looking at some museum data and some other community science data. And they went to go see where they probably could find it. And they found this species and it's the first record in um, 70 years. And this, there's some professionals and some volunteers on this paper. And then this is just an amazing frog that was taken by a photographer um, in Colombia. Um, he was at his like vacation house, I guess. He's a professional photographer, loved taking pictures of frogs, took a picture of this frog and uploaded it. And it turns out that it's a new species. And so someone saw it on iNaturalist and they mounted an expedition to go collect and find this frog and describe the species. Um, and so, so really, you know, obser every observation is important. It can be a new species. It can also under help us understand the ranges of really common things. So making and sharing observations are is a really fun, and those data are really important for science. So I wanted to talk a little bit about. Okay, so some of those observations I showed you, those are people that use iNaturalist, maybe because they're already naturalists. They found iNaturalist because there are scientists, they, they like thought, oh, this, they found the app I naturalist and they thought, oh, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life, right, an app like this. But not everybody's like that. Um, and sometimes it's great to get together with people and to do this together. And we hold events called BioBlitzes, like the one that's coming up this weekend um, at the SLU, um, where people come together in one place at one time and try to document as many plants and animals as they can. And usually it's a mix of people who are amazing experienced naturalists and people that are curious and want to explore places together. And we can do this using the iNaturalist app and getting out and making and sharing observations will help us understand what's found in that place, um, probably in many cases in the most comprehensive way that's ever been done um, by the public. You know, a lot of times scientists go out and have done surveys, but this is a different kind of data, data that everyone's helping collect and that's open and, and freely available for everyone. So BioBlitzes help us create a species list for a place. They help our parks and managers um, make more informed management decisions because they know, have not only a list of what's in their place that they manage, but an atlas because it tells you where those things are found. Um, for example, if you find a new invasive species, um, if someone finds one during a bio blitz, this really helps managers like know where it is to help eradicate it as soon as possible. Um, bio blitzes help people learn more about their local biodiversity, and you just get to be out in nature together with people being curious and taking photos and sharing what you find, not only online, but in person. So the things that we tell people like how to bio blitz, like what do you do when you bio blitz? Like, should I be able to bio blitz if I don't know everything? Like, I don't know my species, like how can I do it? But the thing is, is you don't have to know what you're looking at. You just need to be able to be curious and explore and to 
notice if something's different than something else. Um, so really what we do together is look for as many different species as possible and make observations of them using iNaturalist. And like I showed you before, you don't have to know what that species is. You can use the machine learning and it will make suggestions. It's just really important that you take good, clear photos so the machine and other people can help identify what you found. Um, when we hold biobuses, we usually come back together at the end to share what we found. In COVID, this is changing a little bit, so it's not everyone comes back all together because you might have to, to gather inside, but um, you can always look on iNaturalist and see what everyone has found together. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, when we hold bioblitzes, we usually send people out to cover a whole area, like in, a, in different groups to go on every trail in the park or as many as possible. And we all look and make observations together. Um, and we get to meet each other, we get to discover, we get to learn from each other. You know, sometimes our conversations are about salamanders we might find, but other times you have conversations about other things and you meet people and you build community. Um, and it's just a really lovely way to spend time in nature together. We haven't held many biobuses since COVID, so I, I actually miss it quite a lot. So I'm looking forward to, to getting back out there. Um, I've learned so much from the community um, in person about where to look for different things or different stories about different plants and animals and learning about how different people are connected to these place, these animals or plants, like someone's story about a flower or how their like grandmother might've used this plant to cook or um, you know their last time they saw a salamander, just learning from people helps, um, helps us all appreciate nature in different ways and it helps us understand how other people appreciate nature. So when you do a bio blitz, this is kind of what the data looked like. Like each one of these little points are an observation that someone made. We all were hiking within this, this orange area. Um, this is just an example bio blitz from, from 2018, where just about 30 people all together made almost 900 observations of, of 185 species. Um, and this is like an amazing way to understand the park, not only for us as individuals, but for the folks that manage the, the park. Um, Bioblitzes usually make a little leaderboard. So for people that are competitive, they can see themselves on the top of the most observations list or the most species, um, but you can also see the most observed species over that day. And this all happens automatically if you set up a Bioblitz project on iNaturalist and anyone can do this. So not just me, not just Ariel, like anyone can set up a Bioblitz project. Um, so we hold a lot of bioblitzes, but a couple things that we do that Ariel already mentioned are coordinated bioblitzes, and I want to talk briefly about two. One is called the City Nature Challenge, and the other is called Snapshot Cal Coast. So the City Nature Challenge is coming right up, and it is a biodiversity documentation kind of collaboration. It used to be a contest before COVID, but we now we just collaborate. Um, between cities and metro areas around the world. So it started in 2016, just between the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles. And for the San Francisco Bay Area, um, City Nature Challenge is the nine Bay Area counties that touch the Bay. So it's not all cities. There are plenty of non-city areas in those nine counties. And what we all do is over four days at the end of April and the beginning of May, get out with our communities and make and share nature observations. And that looks different, looks the same, and different all over the world. So here are some cities, um, some city nature challenge cities. Um, and this is just, just like a bio blitz that I just showed you, but instead of being a couple hours at one park, this is, um, oops, this is a little hidden. Sorry, you can't see it. This is just, oh no, here it is. This is people getting out all over the Bay Area, right? So this is, all of the observations made during um, City Nature Challenge in 2021, where we made about 33,000 observations across the whole Bay Area over four days. So it's set up just like a bio blitz, but it's over four days. And any observation that's made and shared on iNaturalist in this area, so in the nine Bay Area counties, is automatically counted for the bio blitz. Um, this year, in 2022, there are over 450 cities all over the world participating in the City Nature Challenge. There's a City Nature Challenge website, citynaturechallenge.org. You can go see the list of cities if you want. Um, unfortunately, the Monterey Bay Area is not partic doesn't participate in the City Nature Challenge, but next year, rope an aerial in to, to host, um, to run the, the City Nature Challenge um, in the Bay Area. 
I'm in the Monterey Bay area. But um, if you want to make it up just a little bit into Santa Clara County, you can, um, or San Mateo County, you can go make some observations that would count toward the City Nature Challenge. I um, mean, this is a really amazing way to engage people with nature all over the world. And the data that are collected during the City Nature Challenge, last year over the four days across all of the cities, it was we collected over a million observations. And those data are the biggest like input of data to iNaturalist year over year. And one of the coolest things is that people that come to iNaturalist because of City Nature Challenge stay. So when you see the growth in users, it stays. Like people do it first for City Nature Challenge and then they continue participating on iNaturalist after that. So the other project that we run is a little closer to home. Um, it's called Snapshot Cal Coast. And this is just along the coast of California. And this is really community working together to document the biodiversity of the California coast from Del Norte to San Diego. So across our whole coast. Um, Allison and I, Allison who's my co-director, we are both marine biologists and an invertebrate zoologist. And we have been doing work um, up here in San Mateo County in the tide pools with a group of volunteers for almost 10 years now. And we do, we go out together and we make iNaturalist observations, but we also do some regular monitoring. Um, and so over the time that we've been there, we've been able to create this huge atlas of what's found at Pillar Point. And Pillar Point is where the Maverick Surf Contest happens, if those of you who might be familiar with Mavericks. And before we started this work, there wasn't even a species list for this place. It's immediately adjacent to a marine reserve, but I mean, there were some studies, but there wasn't really a comprehensive species list. And so we've been able to build up not only just a list, but this atlas over time with our volunteers. Um, and so there's something really special about a group of volunteers that know a place really well. And while we were collecting these data, we were we started to observe um, sea star wasting disease. Maybe many of you have heard about the sea star wasting disease that happened in about 2014, 2015, where almost all the starfish or sea star species across our along our coast um, were infected with a wasting disease and started to die and disappear. So we are able to document this. We also were able to track the recovery and start these stars, especially the species Pisaster cratius, is doing quite well now. Um, and so we were able to, to track this with volunteers. And during that same time, there was a warm water blob off the coast of California. And we were also saw this big increase locally in San Mateo County of this sea slug, of this native rank. It's normally pretty there once in a while, it's a little bit rare, but this became the most common species in the tide pools. It's about two inches big and bright hot pink. And so this was really surprising to us. We knew it was associated with warm water events. But we started thinking about how we were seeing this in one place. And we heard stories about people seeing the here, seeing changes due to, due to warm water events up and down the California coast. So we thought, what if we could engage volunteers up and down the coast at one point in time to be able to track these changes over time, not just at one place at Pillar Point in San Mateo County, but all along the coast. So we enlisted the help of the Marine Protected Area Collaborative Network, which is an organization of a network of, um, of collaboratives, a network of networks um, up and down the state of California. And we said, hey, everybody, if we gave you the tools and the training to use iNaturalist, could you organize your communities, whether they be volunteers or grad students or um, camp kids coming to camp and get out and make observations. And together we could paint this picture of biodiversity along our coast and how it's changing. And so that's what we do. And we've been doing it every year since 2016. People out in the tide pools taking pictures all over the coast and all different habitats, mostly rocky intertidal, but some estuaries, some sandy beaches, like anywhere that we can, can gather data together. Um, I wanted to show an example of a, an event that, that Ariel hold, held in 2018. So, you know, this is just a little bio blitz, right? This is people getting out one morning and making and sharing these observations. Um, and, and, you know, just 30 people making 300 observations along a pretty big area is tells us what's found that day. And if you imagine people doing that all along the coast over two weeks every summer, collectively, we've gathered a ton of data together. So collectively, you know, we've gathered about 340,000 observations of about 8,000 species over the years. This ranks like the number of observations we made every year. You can see 2020 is a little strange. That's because when COVID hit, 
we had a very long window for a snapshot Cal Coast because so many beaches were closed and people couldn't out get to get, get couldn't get out to beaches um, all the time. So we extended the window. So it looks a little strange, but um, that's just because it was for a longer time. Um, and so we have this picture of biodiversity that we have built together along the California coast. And that, those data are really useful locally um, to make decisions like folks at state parks use those data immediately to make decisions or other um, coastal managers. But we work with the state of California with the California Ocean Protection Council to use those data to help understand the coast on, at scale. And so we've built a couple tools um, that I just wanted to highlight. And we did some work a couple of years ago to take those iNaturalist data, these data collected by people like you and me just out at the beach for a day, and to see if we could pick up trends that we knew happened. Because you can imagine these data are kind of messy, right? They're not collected like regular scientific data. They're not collected with strict protocols. But if we do protocols and some analyses of these data on the back end, we can help eliminate some of those biases that, that, are, that come because people are just taking pictures of whatever they want to take pictures of. And we can um, find trends that we know have happened. So this is just a graph of starfish wasting disease, right? So you can see this black line is the number of starfish or sea stars. And then you can see this huge decline. And that's the signal of starfish wasting disease. If you looked at iNaturalist data just on their own for when sea stars started dying, you actually see a huge increase in sea stars because everyone went to the coast to try to take photos of starfish because they heard they were dying. But if you analyze the data, you can pick up what we know is the actual trend, the sea star wasting. And similarly, that Hopkins rose, that bright pink nudibranch, this is a graph of seeing the huge increase that we saw of that nudibranch um, during that warm water event. And so we did this work. This is all done with volunteer collected data. And now we're working with those data to say, OK, we can pick up trends that happened before. But now can we do some forecasting? Can we say, hey, as things change along our coast, can we forecast what might happen? And so we've built a couple tools that were, were just like kind of getting online now. One is a tool that helps us look at places along the California coast that are predicted to have different, that are, that are exposed to climate change. And so this is just a picture of the Monterey Bay. And you can see these, these squares of different colors are places that based on climate pro projections are projected to have some impacts. And so you can see these red squares are projected to have impacts from sea level rise, sea surface temperature increase, and sea surface temperature velocity. That just means that it's getting hotter faster. And so we built this model and we say, hey, like this is what our models say about changes we might see along the coast. And we're asking people to go to this website and tell us about these places, because this is just a model. And we say, hey, if you know this place, like, would you go to this beach? Like, is this a place that you could go make iNaturalist observations? Because if we want to build a tool that can do some forecasting, we need to know, have people make observations from these places that change is projected to occur. And so anybody can fill out this tool. And what we're doing, this is just a little snapshot. What, what we're building is a way, and you don't have to understand the details of this, except that these black lines are real data. And these red and blue and, and yellow lines in the second set of graphs are projections based on data from iNaturalist. And so this is all just in development, but what we're building is a tool that will help project increases or decreases of different species um, based on climate projections that will be really useful for folks that manage the ocean um, and make decisions to be able to dynamically have a different set of data that help inform some of their discussions and their decisions. And we couldn't do anything like this without you know, thousands of people making and sharing those observations. So this year, Snapshot Cal Coast is June 13th to July 4th. Um, and there will be local events up and down the coast. And you can also just get out to the coast and make and share observations. Um, so that's all I wanted to talk with you. I wanted to about tonight, and um, I have some websites here. Um, if you wanted to take a little screenshot, they're not linked since we're on Zoom. Um, 
but, and you can also just go to the Cal, our Cal Academy Community Science website that's listed here. Um, you can Google that pretty easily and you can find any of the resources that I shared. Oops. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It is so wonderful listening to you. You're exuberant and excited and passionate about things. Um, and then, you know, super knowledgeable about how this science is at, or how this community science has been influencing um, science in other places. So thank you for sharing tonight. Um, for those who are watching, I've dropped, um, I think probably every did. into the chat. I was trying to track them as they went. Um, so if you're watching on Zoom, you can see all of those links now. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, I will be dropping those links into the chat um, as soon as this is over, um, because right now I'm doing it on my phone and it doesn't lend itself <laughs> to that. Um, but we will share all the same links so that you have access to them as well. And right now is a good time if you have a question about iNaturalist or community science monitoring um, or some of these bio blitzes or some of these um, sort of databases that have been created, feel free to drop your questions into either the chat box if you're on Zoom or into the comment section if you're on Facebook. I can see both of them. Um, but I wanted to ask a quick question, um, okay. mostly because I, I grew up in Los Angeles, surrounded by concrete, believing there was no nature there, um, and then discovered as an adult returning from this oasis that is Santa Cruz, there's all this wildlife. Um, I go home now and I find all of these amazing spaces and green spaces tucked into um, what I had initially always thought of as a very urban spot. And I have found some really cool things and really interesting species. And so I wanna ask you as somebody who's gone out into both wild spaces and really cool urban wild spaces, what is the coolest thing you found or the thing that stood out the most or surprised you the most? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. I have to say, I'm kind of the same. I grew up in the suburbs of, of LA, nature there. And now when I go back, I'm like, let's go hiking. Like, let's go <laughs> like look for nature all the time. And, um, you know, I've been super fortunate to be able to spend time with people. Um, I live in San Francisco, but to, to spend time with people in nature here, like exploring just so many different places together. I think for me, one of the, the most exciting things is that the first time that I saw here in San Francisco, not far from the Academy, so just in the Sunset District, so kind of between Ocean Beach and UCSF, if you can like kind of imagine. So between Ocean Beach and the center of the city, there are a series of hills there that um, are little hilltops. And in San Francisco, hilltops are some of the last remaining um, natural areas because they're very difficult to develop. And um, once houses started being built, people like lobbied to keep those spaces um, to be parks. And so really near where I'm sitting right now, there's a series of hilltop parks that were protected by the neighbors. And um, this tiny little butterfly called a green hair streak, maybe some of you know it because it does fly down there, um, flies on those hills still, mostly because neighbors have planted the, and tended the, um, the food plants for this butterfly. But the first time that I saw this tiny, bright green butterfly, you know, in the middle of the city um, was amazing, right? And so to think that like it's there right now and that I could go take a picture of it. And they're also hard to find because they're, they're tiny and they're, they don't move a lot. Um, so that's one of my favorites is um, anytime I see that butterfly. But I think the first time I saw it up on those hills was really incredible. Awesome. I was just in LA looking at some butterflies. So awesome. I'm going to have awesome. to look them up. You have to go look them up. It's a good time for butterflies right now too. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I had a question that came in on Facebook. Um, somebody was asking how their organization that's currently doing Sea Star Counts in Pacifica can mm -hmm. hook up with your program both. Um, and I think, you know, with iNaturalist and with maybe California Academy of Sciences and the bio blitzes that you host on iNaturalist. So what is the best way for people who are doing some of this stuff to get more involved? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that, you know, on, we have a, an email on our website that's just community science at calacademy.org. So you can send us a note. Um, we also have a list um, 
that we send out to all of our tide pool volunteers that work with us down in pillar point so people can add, ask to have their name added to that list um so for someone who's in pacifica because that's really close to here i think that's a great way to learn more and to, to talk with us directly um and if the organization that's doing those sea star counts wants to hold an event for snapshot cal coast like and just get out to the beach that you normally do counts at and do a little bio blitz with your team that's an amazing way to participate in snapshot cal coast and so you can just send an email and I'll add you to the Snapshot Cal Post distribution list. Um, we sometimes write a newsletter. We haven't in quite some time, but we sometimes have a newsletter that we tell people about things coming up. Um, but on our website, we have all of our events um, that are coming up for City Nature Challenge and um, we will have it for Snapshot Cal Post. But if you're interesting in part, interested in partnering, you can email me directly or use that, that um, community science link for sure. Um, and there are tons of other videos, I mean, about how to use iNaturalist. So if you wanted to train other people how to use them, you can, can find them online. Um, and if you want some tips on which ones are good, you can ask them. I will say the, uh, the help section of iNaturalist is really on it. Yeah. Um, I was a, I think my first BioBlitz, I planned entirely off of tutorial videos and it went totally. just fine. Exactly. So they really are incredibly thorough in um, making sure that you have all the information prepared um, and including, we do have a question I'll get to in a second about you know, students and working with school students and the whole other world that that opens up. Um, but from that, that lens of curation and setting up projects, um, somebody was asking how much do admins of these projects curate? What if people upload not great photos? Um, can you weed them out at the back end? So no, not really. So that's a short answer. So it depends how you set up your project. So if there are lots of different ways to set up projects. Um, the projects that I showed today are mostly like gather, tell, they tell iNaturalist, gather every observation from this place at this time and put it into a project. Um, and I am looking for every observation um, that comes in. And then um, the community can help curate those, like the, the on the front end of iNaturalist can help curate those um, and move those from needs ID to um, research grade. But if people, if you have a project set up like that and the photos, you're just like, these photos aren't great. It's not really, you know, it's not really what I'm looking for. Like I really wanted to have a project that was like the wildflowers of Santa Cruz County um, or the flowers of Santa Cruz County. And I just wanted it to be really, I wanted um, you, you, that means that you probably would have to do some work on the regular iNaturalist to make things research grade to bring them into your project. Um, so you would have better photos. Um, I would say just depending on the scale of your project, the best thing to do would be to, to like, we can write journal posts in projects. And so you can, if people, you'd have to encourage people to join your project, but um, you could write a little note and help people learn how to take better photos or hold a bio blitz in that place and maybe invite everyone whose observations have made it into your project. You can do some inviting on iNaturalist and get them to come and then do some like photo tutorials. So kind of try to help people take better photos. This might not be possible if it's a place that's like far away or because you just made a, a project because you're interested in a place. Um, but there's really not a way to like get people's photos out of a project. You could make a project that was, there is a way to set up a project that's members only. So if you wanted a project that was, you know, just your like 10 best pals who are amazing photographers, you can set one up that's just you by using their usernames on iNaturalist and then you have more control over what's in there. And um, you can also say, I only want it to be frogs or I only want it to be this species. Um, so there are lots of other kinds of controls, um, but not like, I mean, there there is something that you probably could click that says I can't possibly even identify this. Like there's just like no way to identify this, um, but it's a little trickier. Yeah. So go like the education route more than the like kicking people out route if you can. Definitely. Definitely. And I think, you know, doing, um, I've seen a lot of bio blitzes and I know at our site, we've been shifting them to include a lot of upfront, 
kind of training on like how to use this and what what is a good photo because yeah you take that photo of a big bush and it just looks like nothing um and so how can you use this tool to get you know all observations are important and valuable but some of them are gonna be easier to grab and take than others so how do you move yours towards that um so absolutely loading education um we had a question um, from somebody who's another uh, environmental educator she's working with high school students and they're learning how to identify aquatic macro invertebrates and how they are a proxy for water quality um but they're struggling with taking good photos of them so yeah (laughs) context for others who don't immediately know what an aquatic macro invertebrate is we're thinking tiny things things that would fit on your pinky fingernail how do you get a good photo of those are there tools are there special tricks what have you used rebecca oh my gosh this is a really good question okay so it depends if you're trying to take the photos in the field or if you're collecting right and you can get back to a space so if you can collect um even just temporarily like it's gonna take them back eventually um and you can get to a dissecting microscope yeah, I mean, a dissecting microscope, they, they have these attachments now for your phone, right? This would, that's like the, the easiest, even though they still move, right? So it, it can be tricky even in that setting. Um, in the field, you know, the thing that's probably the easiest is to, there are a couple of different things I've seen people do, is getting like clear boxes that are a little bit small so they can't move around so much and having a space that you can put your phone and take a, a photo, you know, into a clear box. Um, people also use black bottoms, like bowls or like takeout containers, right? Cause like sometimes having that black background can be really good for taking photos. So sometimes white backgrounds are good and sometimes black backgrounds are good. Um, and having some good lighting can help. So like having, even if you're having a better camera than your phone, although phone cameras now are like amazing, but having some more light, um, can help. But I would say like the smaller the container, and the stiller you can try to keep things, the better. And then just try to um, experiment with different backgrounds. Um, and there are some things that are so small that it's it's just going to be really, really hard without, um, if, if not a phone, but like sometimes they also make macro lenses. There are macro lenses that will fit onto your phone. Some of the new iPhones, like they have pretty good macro, but the clip-on lenses I found are amazing for taking close-up photos and you can get those for, you know, just under $20 um, on Amazon um, and clip it right onto your camera to take some some closer up photos. So I would try that. And then really those black takeout um, containers, they're, they're, they're plastic, they're, they're not great to get anywhere, but you can like save them and you can use them for that. That's one of the things that, that I use. Yeah. But it's awesome. really, really hard, so. <laughs> those tiny ones. Yeah, I would say definitely. We've used the um, the clip magnifiers that hook on yeah. your phone, and they are really good. Um, I was blown away by how like big you could get things and how maneuverable they were. Sometimes you put a magnifier yeah. on something, and it's really right. magnified, but you can no longer find anything. Exactly. So yeah, there are some really good, um, not terribly, terribly, overwhelmingly expensive um tools that you can get if you're looking specifically for those smaller things um yeah. and yeah take out containers sure. free, except you do have to pay for the food part of them right you have to pay for the food first we when we do our, our work in the tide pools we use um underwater cameras so i don't use my i mean i do use my phone above water in the tide pools but otherwise i use a digital camera that's waterproof that has a great macro lens for close-up and that tags my photos with gps coordinates um and so that's a really, it's for freshwater invertebrates or aquatic invertebrates, it's not as easy because you the water isn't always very clear. So you need to move it out. Oh, that's the other thing I should have said. If you can move it into clean water, obviously that's like a good um, um, a good way, but make sure it's like the right salinity, right? So, but if it's fresh water, you can just use fresh water. Um, that will be super helpful. So. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's all of the questions. There's definitely some folks on Facebook who are interested. You'll probably be getting some emails from people who want to right. <laughs> um, hook up and get more involved, especially with that snapshot Cal Coast aspect. Okay. Uh, but I just wanted to end on um, a question that I've been asking some of our speakers this year more frequently, um, yeah. because we are we're currently in this kind of atmosphere that feels 
in the environmental edge education world and just in in the world of nature enthusiasts as a whole we often get kind of trapped in this feeling of doom and gloom about the future and that uncertainty. Um, but there is so much to be hopeful about and to explore and to find and to protect going forward. And so I just wanna know what is the thing, um, and it's okay if there's multiple things, you can pick one. What is the thing that makes you hopeful um, or excited about getting out into nature and doing the work that you're doing? Oh my gosh, that's a really good question. I mean, I think right now, since we've been apart for so long, really, and people are just starting to be together, it's really being back together with people in nature is something that I'm really excited about. Um, you know, some of our, we have events next weekend for City Nature Challenge, and those will be some of our big, like first events with partners and um, getting people outside again. And so I'm really looking forward to that. That kind of gives me hope and joy because I, it's hard sometimes, right? I mean, I enjoy being in nature all the time and with my family or just me, but like there's something about being in community with people that you haven't met before and learning about a place together that I really miss and that that gives me hope. Um, the other thing kind of at a bigger scale is that you know right now the state of California is taking some pretty huge strides to protecting biodiversity in our state. Um, you know, the governor and his team at Natural Resources are supporting protecting 30% of the co land and coastal waters um, by 2030 with an eye toward equity and climate resilience and nature access for everyone um, and protecting biodiversity. And I think it's really exciting. It's like the first time that I've really seen biodiversity celebrated at the state level. And the fact that, you know, like I'm talking to them about like, how can we use these community collected data to help inform what you're doing? That feels really exciting to me. So that gives me hope as well. So absolutely. So you hear, heard it here. You're feeling down and out about it. Go hang out with some people and in get nature. nerdy in nature and look for stuff. Um, exactly. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining on whichever platform you're here on. And uh, just as a reminder, again, I will be putting all the links, all the places, I promise. Um, it just might take me a minute. And we will be uploading a version of this to the Elkhorn Slough Foundation YouTube page. So if you want to rewatch or check it out in the future, you can see it there or at the Elkhorn Slough Preserve Facebook page. Um, and definitely check it out. Get out and check out some of these cool events that are happening in your local area. And everybody have a wonderful, fun night. Thank you all for coming. Right. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Bye.